Let's turn to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10 and verse 2, where we read of a Gentile, a Roman, who seeks God. And he's described as a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always, for always. In order to understand this chapter, we need to recognize its context, because that is key to the remarkable events that are recorded in this chapter. The visions of Cornelius and Peter and the wonderful providence that would direct Peter to preach to a gathered group of Gentile seekers, earnestly desiring to know the way of salvation. It was ten years since the day of Pentecost, roughly, when the events of this chapter took place. The gospel has spread from Jerusalem through to Samaria on account of persecution. Many of the believers in Jerusalem have been dispersed further afield, especially across Judea, here in Joppa and uh, Lydda, and soon further afield. Proselytes have been converted. A proselyte is someone of non-Jewish birth who wholly embraced the Jewish religion and conformed to all the rites and ceremonies of Moses. But here is a pivotal moment in the history of the gospel when the apostles will be led by the Lord to proclaim the way of salvation to Gentiles, non-Jewish people. Cornelius himself feared the Lord, but there's no suggestion that he had fully become a proselyte. The language here is very different and suggests that as a non-Jew, he heard and received the gospel of Jesus Christ and was greatly blessed. They will be directly added unto the church with no expectation to conform to the old rites and ceremonies of the Old Testament. And so this chapter fulfills the, the promises that were made through the prophets in the Old Testament. Many of the Jews hadn't registered the significance of these promises. Even the apostles and disciples struggled uh, to fully appreciate the purposes of God to build an international church of Jesus Christ. Let me read to you what we find in Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 3. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy rising. Lift up thine eyes round about, and see, all they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far, and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then shalt thou see, and flow together, and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. These are the words of the Lord speaking prophetically to the people of God, to the church. And it anticipates the ingathering of huge numbers of Gentile believers. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, not of the old Jewish fold. He saw the Gentile nations and he knew that in the purposes of his father, they would be brought in to the kingdom. 
the Apostle Paul himself, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 3, says that by revelation, God made known unto me the mystery, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What was that mystery? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. And so this chapter is going to narrate to us a radical change in the purposes of God and in the thinking of the Apostle Peter. Peter would come to understand that the old ceremonial law, its rites, its teaching, things clean, things unclean, the separation between Jew and Gentile, all these things have now come to an end. They were enshrined in the Old Testament for the Jewish nation until the coming of Christ. These laws and the principles behind them were designed to preserve the people of God from the corrupting influence of the paganism that would, uh, would pervade all the nations of the world. But now the purposes of God has come to that point where the gospel will go from the Jewish apostles and it will be presented and believed by many who heard it. And the community of believers in this chapter must understand the opening of the door of the church to the Gentile nations. And that's why there were these remarkable visions if you look at chapter 11, we'll look at it later, God willing, you'll see there that the Jewish believers had many misgivings. They began to challenge Peter. Peter, we've heard that you went into a, 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 a Gentile household, to an unclean nation, and you preached Christ, and you baptized them. And Peter has to narrate the remarkable way in which the Lord had guided him as an apostle that this was the will of God. And they conclude then, then has the Lord sent the gospel unto the nations. They grasp, it dawns upon their mind that the very character and fabric of the church is to be an international one, not just confined to people who were Jewish as in the first instance. Well, when we come to this chapter then, events are already moving on. Did you notice at the end of chapter 9, we're told where Peter is lodging? He's lodging with a tanner. Now, what does a tanner do? He takes the bodies of dead animals, he strips off the hide, and he turns it into leather. But in the Old Testament, those that handle dead bodies are unclean. But Peter seems to have already lost any scruples he may have had about lodging with a man whose very industry rendered him unclean. Probably his house was outside the, the town. It was down by the seaside, partly because the trade that he was following would have been a smelly one and it would have been associated with filth and uncleanness, partly because he needed to wash the hides of the animals before he could turn them into leather. And so he had access to the Mediterranean, uh, as much water as he needed in order to cure the, and cleanse these hides. But we see the picture already. That's where Peter is lodged. Some of the old commentators point out that if Peter was indeed the first pope, he had a very different lodging to the current pope. 
he was quite happy to lodge with the mean and lowly members of society, those whose trades were somewhat, if not questionable, certainly humble and lowly. This was Peter when he gets a call from Caesarea. But Peter is going to need clear direction from the Lord before he is willing to go with these men who are sent from Caesarea. And so we come to Cornelius, and there's so much to encourage, to instruct us, as we learn of this man who will become, at least in some ways, the first Gentile convert to Christ. He will be subject to a remarkable vision. But not every person of Cornelius' background and position who turns to Christ will have the privilege of an encounter with an angel. Why did the Lord grant to Cornelius this particular vision? Well, Cornelius is to be the first in a multitude who would become a mighty stream entering into the church of Jesus Christ. But he is the first. And the Lord must put a divine stamp upon this step which is going to take place. Sovereignty of God is certainly prominent here. If you look through this chapter, you see the hand of the Lord overruling in Cornelius' life, overruling in Peter's life, bringing them together, the gospel being proclaimed so explicitly, and then the Lord sovereignly demonstrating by the giving of the Holy Spirit that he is behind all the uh, the that the events that uh, evolve in this chapter, God is sovereign. Cornelius begins to seek the Lord, but the Lord has already been at work in Cornelius' life. And yet at the same time, we must not lose sight of man's duty and man's responsibility, our responsibility. As this chapter unfolds, we see how the Lord blessed a man who sought him, an unlikely man, a man who not only by nation but by trade was so far off from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet in seeking, the Lord heeds that cry and he is brought to know the way of salvation. And so there's encouragement here. There's not one person who seeks the Lord earnestly, as Cornelius did, whom the Lord will not richly reward and draw to himself. So the first thing I want us to note is that Cornelius is an example of the grace of God and the welcome of the gospel. What an example he is. He almost, you could say, and perhaps the Lord deliberately selects Cornelius to be the first Gentile convert because he will, in one fell swoop, you might say, banish every prejudice and every scruple a Jewish believer may have concerning a Gentile convert. There were so many hurdles between Cornelius and a knowledge of Christ. He was a Gentile. We're told he was of the Italian band. And the reputation was that the Italians were very proud. Proud of their history. Proud of their ideas. Proud of their religious views. That could so easily have been a stumbling block before Cornelius ever began to think about the God 
of the Jewish nation. He was a Roman, part of the oppressive ruling, ruling class. What did he want with looking to one of the oppressed people groups, the Jewish people? He was a soldier. For a Jew, the Roman soldiers represented imposters. They wanted nothing to do with them. They would, and they looked forward to the day when they hoped that the shackles of Rome and Roman military might would be taken away and Israel would once again be a free and illustrious nation. It would have stuck in the Jewish, thro the Jewish throat, naturally speaking, for a soldier to receive the gospel. And not just an ordinary soldier, he was an officer, one of the, uh, the prominent class. He had wealth, he had power, he had reputation, he had everything to lose to become a Christian. And that's Cornelius. And the Lord will deal with him and bring him to a knowledge of Christ and he will be entered into the role of the church of Jesus Christ. The middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile is to be fully and finally broken down. That's what Paul writes of. If you read Ephesians chapter 2, the middle wall of partition between the Jew and the Gentile, the God-fearing nation and the pagan nation. It will be broken down in Christ. I look out this morning on our congregation, and isn't it a wonderful thing that people from so many different national backgrounds can come together and unite in worship through the Lord Jesus Christ different skin colors, different cultural backgrounds. There are no barriers. In the church of Jesus Christ, that's where you could say multiculturalism. It's not multiculturalism, is it? But where multinational bounds are broken down and there is that oneness in Jesus Christ. And Cornelius has been selected in the purposes of God to illustrate, to demonstrate this fact such that all the Jews, and particularly the apostles and the believing Jews, should understand that in the church of Jesus Christ, there is to be no prejudice, no national prejudice, but they all are one in Christ Jesus. Here, is a license for preachers from this moment on to take the gospel to the Gentiles. And from this chapter onwards, when you read the remaining part of the Acts of the Apostles, the focus is increasingly upon the work of the Lord amongst the Gentile nations, first in Antioch and ultimately in the last chapter in Rome itself. Cornelius, just one final thought before we move on here. A certain man in Caesarea. Why was this place called Caesarea? It was a wonderful port facility that had been constructed by the civil engineers of the day, and it was named after Caesar Augustus. It was his territory, in a sense. There was a very public reminder. Every time you mentioned the name of this town, it was Caesar's port. And yet in Caesarea, that's where the first Gentile convert is to be called by grace, right under the nose of this pagan ruler. He will give up one of his officers, in a sense, to the kingdom and to the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's the first thing. Here is an example 
of the grace of God to a most unlikely man. And what a demonstration it sounds of the welcome of the gospel to all who seek the Lord. And that's the second thing I want us to look at this morning in more detail, perhaps. Cornelius is presented to us as a sincere seeker. From God's perspective, we see how the Lord works in Cornelius' life and brings him to a knowledge of salvation. From Cornelius' perspective, we see a seeker. In the Old Testament, the Lord said through the prophet Jeremiah, you shall find me when you seek me with all your heart. Cornelius is a confirmation that that is true. Are you seeking the Lord? Some of us this morning here, perhaps up until quite recently, we've not really thought about our soul. We've had no real interest, no concern to find the Lord and forgiveness and to experience his work within our heart and in our life. But now we are beginning to seek. We are concerned. These things have an interest for us. We're beginning to pray. Well, Cornelius here will be a great encouragement to us. In fact, you could say that Cornelius here is, by his sincerity, a challenge to us all. In one sense, he practices many of the marks of genuine God-fearing religion before he has a knowledge of Christ. But you could say this, if you want to seek and find the Lord, then learn from this man. You will find no better example of how to seek and find the Lord and, and know the fruit of that seeking. Don't expect a vision, though. I've tried to explain to you, Cornelius was privileged with this vision because he was the prototype. And the Lord had to put a special stamp at the very beginning of the ingathering of the non-Jewish people into the kingdom of Christ. Nevertheless, none who seek as he did shall be disappointed. So what do we learn of him? Verse 2. Firstly, we're told he was a devout man and one that feared God. In this respect, as he begins to seek the Lord, you could say he goes against all the prevailing attitudes of his background. He's swimming against the current. The Romans were very disparaging and dismissive of the Jews and their religion, generally. Italians, as I said earlier, were known in those times at least for their pride. The military generally were harsh and hardened people. And yet here we find a man who is so different. If we seek the Lord, then in many ways we have to be counter-culture. We have to go against the background and the thinking of this world in which we live. It's clear, it's implied here, that he was dissatisfied with the pagan thinking of Rome. They had their idols, a many. The Greeks, likewise, had similar idols. Some of them were the same imaginary gods with Greek names, Roman names. But it would seem Cornelius had seen through all this sham, imaginary, vain religion. There was nothing to it. And he had become persuaded of the one true God, the God whom the Jews as a nation identified with and who had revealed himself through the Jewish scriptures. Let me ask this question. Have you seen through 
the vanities of our present society. It's ideas. It has its religious views. Atheism is a religion because you need faith to believe atheistic dogma just as much as you need faith to believe the Bible and the testimony of Jesus Christ. But have you seen by or through the dogma of this world? Perhaps for Cornelius, and this is speculation, I suppose, up to a point, but he saw the fruits of Roman religion. He saw the characters that it, that it, that it formed, uh, the immorality, the violence, uh, the discrimination, the crude character of so much of that society. Yes, they made great advance in engineering and uh, civil structures, and yet at the same time, it did nothing for the character and the individual. Selfishness and pride, uncleanness of life, these things prevailed in the Roman society, and perhaps Cornelius had seen through. And for some reason, he had discerned that the God of Israel was so different. And we're told here that he was devout. The word means reverent. And then, to add to that, one that feared God. It conveys the idea of awe. And if you put these two descriptive words together, we're being told here that to this man Cornelius, religion to him was a serious matter, a weighty matter. He sensed the reality of Israel's God. He must have read the Old Testament scriptures and he had been become familiar with the holiness of God and the majesty of God and the justice of God. And it moved this man to a life which was pious and careful. That's the beginning of seeking after God. Do you fear him? Do we have great respect for everything associated with the Lord? Do we take his name in vain or do we treat it with the utmost respect? Do we read his word carefully and thoughtfully or dismissively? Cornelius, that's where we begin to seek the Lord. We take things as he did with devout and godly fear. The starting point for life. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and how that's illustrated here in the person of this centurion. It's remarkable, isn't it, in some ways, that Cornelius should find the God of the Jews. Because in the times in which Cornelius lived, the vast majority of the Jews had no real heartfelt religion in them. They were a people who had a reputation for being troublemakers, for being awkward, for being cantankerous. They had to have garrisons stationed amongst the Jewish people, lest there should be uproar and violence. There was so much about the Jews which caused the Gentiles to blaspheme their God. And yet it would seem that Cornelius in some way saw through the hypocrisy of many of the Jewish nationals. Did he meet some who were like the Simeons of the temple? Genuine, believing Jews who feared the Lord, who anticipated the coming of the Messiah. It would seem he did. Now, we're told further in verse 2 that he feared God with all his house who gave much alms to the people 
and pray to God always. If we start right, the other things will flow. And for Cornelius, that was the case. Why did he affect his household? Why did he give alms? Why did he pray? Because he was devout. Because he feared the Lord. All these other things flow from that. We can almost ask ourselves the question this morning, do I fear God? If you fear God as the head of a household, your household will be affected. Cornelius feared God with all his house. That's remarkable in itself. Later on we shall see that he gathers his kinsmen, his relatives, his friends to hear the message of Peter. But Cornelius didn't keep his God-fearing character to himself he was an influence for good upon all that came under his roof, his immediate kith and kin, his household servants. He had another soldier, we read, that he was sent to Joppa, who was also devout. Here was a man who, even in seeking the Lord, influenced those around him. It shows the sincerity, the genuineness of this man. But then he gave much alms, charity, we might say, to the people who were the people. Well, many of them would have been Jewish people, not even his own nation. But because of the attraction that he had to the God of the Jews, he shows great generosity to the Jews himself, himself. How seriously would people measure your religion and mine? Do they see the fruit, the outworking of our convictions in our daily lives? By our kindness, by our acts of generosity. These things didn't save Cornelius, as we shall see. But they show the genuineness of his seeking heart. He desired to know and know God and receive the blessing of God. And it shows in his health. He prayed to God always. We'll come back to that in a moment. But despite this fact, the description here of Cornelius in chapter 2 is the description of one who needs to be saved. Let me ask this question this morning. Do you tick all the boxes in this verse? You have reverence for God. You stand in awe of him as the mighty creator and judge. You seek to bring your family to be respectful of God's ways. You even pray. But are you content that that makes you a Christian? It doesn't. Cornelius had all these things, and yet when the angel appears to him, and here we are told he saw in a vision evidently. The margin says plainly, clearly. This was no, no vague encounter that he has with the angel. It was a very vivid interview. And it made a lasting impression. But when the angel speaks to him, he says, you need to send for Peter who will tell you what you need to do. Just turn forward to chapter 11 and verse 14, where we're given further insight into what was said. We are told that the angel said to him, send for Peter who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. In other words, Scripture describes Cornelius in these terms, and they are very commendable terms, and yet it says, Cornelius, you're still a lost sinner. Cornelius, you still need to send word to Peter that you may hear 
how to be saved. Being devout doesn't save you. Fearing God alone doesn't save you. Giving to charity doesn't save you. Praying to God doesn't save you. You need something more. And friends, I have to say that to you this morning. If you're resting in those virtues alone, you're not saved. There's something far more that you need. And Cornelius is made alert to that fact. Now, we live in a society where there are loud voices now that say we're a multi-faith society. And there are some lame leaders in professing Christian churches that say, well, you can be saved if you're just sincere in your religion. You can be a sincere so-and-so. But if you're sincere and you pray to your God and you are generous and kind, we don't need to trouble such people, they say. We don't need to evangelize them. Just leave them be. They're good people. That's not how the angel describes Cornelius, is it? He needed to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many sincere people who are sincerely ignorant of Christ. And unless they come to Christ, they will not be found in glory. That's made clear by what happens here to Cornelius. Now, prayer is a prominent feature in this chapter. Firstly, the prayers of Cornelius and then the prayers of Peter. Let me just touch on the prayers of Cornelius and then we must draw to a conclusion. Look at verse 3. Sorry, verse 4. When Cornelius looked on the angel of God, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine arms are come up for a memorial before God. A memorial before God. In Psalm 141, we read this. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Here is a picture of the prayers that Cornelius in all his heartfelt sincerity had made. They have ascended up into heaven and they are come up for a memorial before God. The sense here is that God has a dossier of Cornelius' prayers. A whole file on record. All those unburdenings of uh, the, 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 the size of his heart, the desires of his soul, they are recorded. David would say, put my tears in your bottle. Well, Cornelia's prayers were had in remembrance before God. What would that dossier look like for me? And for you. God keeps a record of the prayers of all that sincerely seek him. He keeps a record of the prayers of all his saints. How big's your dossier than mine? What is on file in the courts of heaven as being your petitions and mine? How frequently? Have we lifted up our hearts to the Lord? Does the Lord have a file and it's got, uh, well, New Year's Day, I pray to the Lord. And then a month later, I lifted up my heart again when I was in some kind of trouble or anxiety. But in between, there's nothing. Or does the Lord have a big fat dossier with all your many prayers and mine? Include it. It would seem that Cornelius' prayers were received by the Lord as coming from a sincere heart and a burdened heart. 
What did Cornelius pray for? The old commentators say something like this. We're not told, but we are told. Because if you see the way the Lord answers, that tells you what Cornelius had prayed for. He sensed in his prayers that he still lacked something before the Lord. There was something further that he needed to hear and he needed to do. Perhaps he was burdened with a sense of his guilt, a desire for peace, for assurance, for clarity, for a clear knowledge of the true God whom he now feared and worshipped. Show me what I must do. That seemed to be the sentiment of Cornelius' prayer. And the Lord says here, look at verse 6. Send for Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou ought to do. There's the answer to his prayers. Message will be brought to you, Cornelius, and you will know fully what God expects of you. May this encourage us to seek the Lord earnestly. How long had Cornelius been praying? We don't know. How many times had Cornelius rehearsed before the Lord those deep, heartfelt desires of his soul? We do not know. Did Cornelius pray with a degree of ignorance? He certainly did. But he prayed all the same. And ultimately the Lord noted those prayers and answered those prayers. And if you and I lay siege to his throne by prayer, he will answer without fail. That's the record and testimony that is given here, connected with this first Gentile seeker. God heard his prayers and answered. Well, may the Lord bless these things to us. We close our worship this morning with him, 351. Behold, the mountain of the Lord in latter days shall rise on mountain tops above the hills and draw the wandering eyes. This is taken from Isaiah chapter 2, which foretells the ingathering of the nations into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. 351.